Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Can you hear me okay? Great. That means that I made technology work by hitting one button. So that's, we're off to a great start today already. Um, so good morning. My name is Amanda McMullen. I'm the president and CEO here at the New Bedford Whaling Museum, whose mission is to ignite learning through explorations of art, history, science, and culture. And I can't think of a day that actually exemplifies um, the power of igniting learning through that interdisciplinary approach more than today. So it's very exciting to be here and to join you and to get you launched. Um, you know, I often say that New Bedford, because of whaling, is truly one of the first early American cities that is a global city. And even today, you will continue to hear every language spoken around our cobblestone streets and beyond in our uh, city and on the South Coast. And because of that, you can only imagine that the Whaling Museum's collection has such an extraordinary, deep, wide, vast range. So the notion that so many of you here today and joining us on Zoom, a hearty crowd, welcome to you, um, are gonna be able to dive really deep and explore our collection and um, have a, a day of deep, deep engaged learning here in New Bedford and here at the Whaling Museum, that warms my heart. So I just wanted to welcome you, kick you off on your journey um, and wish you all the best. The joy of this day is being able to um, thank many scholars and panelists who uh, are giving us their time, their talent and their knowledge base. Um, and one of the great joys is to introduce our chief curator and director of museum learning, Dr. Naomi Slip, who envisioned this whole day and future exhibit on this topic. Um, and I know Naomi will get you settled in. So thank you very much for being here. And with that, Naomi. Uh, uh, thank you for that warm welcome, Amanda. Um, my name is Naomi Slip. I'm the Douglas and Cynthia Crocker Endowed Chair for the Chief Curator and Director of Museum Learning here at the New Bedford Whaling Museum. I'm gonna tip this a little. Can everyone hear me in the back okay? All right. Uh, we do have, I think, a, a, about 40 people registered to join us on Zoom. Um, so we'll be talking to them as well. And I think uh, Nate and Carissa, who are stationed at the back, are gonna keep track of the chat on Zoom too as questions come in. Um, I'm very pleased to convene this symposium to welcome you all here and to engage presenters and audience members in a deep conversation about the global reach of our collections. Uh, today we will consider rich examples of material culture from across the Pacific Rim and query what they might teach us about the relationships between communities throughout the region, 19th century whalers, and histories of colonial maritime exploration during the 19th century and beyond. And we're gonna try. Mm -hmm. oh, okay, uh, so why are we focused on the Pacific Rim? Well, at 63.8 million square miles, the Pacific Ocean is the largest ocean in the world, covering approximately 33% of the Earth's total surface. Here's a good reminder of how much you can fit inside the Pacific Basin. The Pacific Rim comprises, oh, I'm not sure that I'm, okay, there we go. The Pacific, oh. the Pacific Rim comprises the lands around the rim of the Pacific Ocean. Across the Pacific Basin, there are 25 to 30,000 individual islands, about 10,000 of those within the broad region defined as Oceania. Uh, additionally, the Pacific Rim includes the Aleutian Islands chain, the Pacific Northwest, and Russian territories on the Chukchi and Bering Seas. These regions of the Pacific Rim, encompassing parts of the global Arctic, Pacific Northwest, Pacific Islands, and Oceania, have been in home to indigenous groups for millennia and are the historic territory of many species of toothed and baleen whale. And because of this, whaling touched nearly every geographic space in the Pacific. As Ryan Tucker Jones and Angela Wanhala point out in New Histories of Pacific Whaling, quote, long before Europeans came to that ocean, many Pacific peoples traced their ancestries and in some cases built their societies on the backs of whales. As ancestors, whales occupy a privileged place in Pacific societies and histories. 
So across the vast territories of the Pacific Rim, diverse communities have developed unique cultural and material traditions and cosmologies, many of which relate to picture or reference the whale. Okay. In the 19th century, this is my own very squidgy map. Would you believe we don't have an, an easy map readily available that does this? <laughs> In the 19th century, US whalers traveled far and wide to find whales and fulfill demand for whale oil and whale product. Whale fishing grounds spread across the Pacific and into the Arctic, and a New Bedford vessel could spend years traveling between Pacific Island groups or one hunting season through the Bering Strait in Utkivuk. These maritime routes presented opportunities for exploration and trade and facilitated mobility for people from across the Pacific Rim. Many indigenous communities with localized whaling traditions were drawn into these global networks. And as we will see today, diverse communities, those aboard whalers and those within communities that whalers uh, visited, um, grappled with the experiences of encounter brought about by whaling. This phenomenon is what literary historian Mary Louise Pratt described in 1991 as contact zones, or spaces where, quote, cultures meet, clash, and grapple with each other, often in contexts of highly asymmetrical relations of power, such as colonialism, slavery, or their aftermaths, as they are lived out in many parts of the world today, end quote. These narratives that we'll explore today are bound up with economic histories of high capitalism, resource extraction, and material excess. And in this way, we touch upon environmental themes as well, replete with decimations of species and ecosystems. Many presenters query the meanings of colonial encounter, global capitalism and its pathways, and grapple with the legacies of colonialism, imperialism, uh, and imperialism with the region of the Pacific Rim. From a less anthropocentric perspective, whaling is not actually a story about people. It is actually a story about whales. The annihilation of individual whales themselves and the monumental totality of their evisceration is evoked in the artworks we will encounter today. The material culture of whaling and its legacies is inscribed upon the very bones and bodies of whales. So today we think about whales as much as about whaling. This symposium builds upon a significant body of scholarship on American scrimshaw that has been supported by the New Bedford Whaling Museum over the past many decades. Leading scholars in US scrimshaw have looked to the museum's collection and other keystone collections of scrimshaw, including regionally at the Nantucket Historical Society, Mystic Seaport Museum, and Peabody Essex Museum. These individuals have laid the foundation for engaging with scrimshaw as a global vernacular art form informed by travel, trade, and intersection. Traditionally, scholars working across the museum and academy have looked at scrimshaw, as with many other art forms, within confines of material, training, or maker's identity. This way of examining, categorizing, and understanding material productions is strongly defined by material, nation, state, geography, or a maker's ethnic and national identity. Such modes of categorization are common in museums and university departments. Indeed, if we reflect for a moment, uh, expertise and indeed our entire collection areas are often divided based upon what they are made from or where they were made. But what of those things made on the ocean and from the very materials of the sea? And what of the productive intersections that occurred on and of whaling routes and whaling vessels? Recently, scholars have begun to look beyond traditional nation states toward the space of the ocean itself as an active geography. Of course, maritime studies has done this for decades, but for those working in the emerging fields of blue humanities or ocean studies, interdisciplinary scholarship allows for the consideration of material culture within a trans-regional or global context, an area connected by the spaces of the seas and not confined to territorial lines on a map. In addition, indigenous scholars and those working within indigenous geographies or with community-centered collections are decentering the traditional geographies of academic disciplines and the methods of material culture studies to consider themes of community, cultural heritage, native identity, and materials, and to demonstrate indigenous sovereignty and survivance. Um, we don't. I'm not touching anything. I'm going back and forth here. <laughs> The wider world in Scrimshaw is an exciting opportunity to bring together leading scholars and new voices working on the material culture of the area of the Pacific Rim and to explore an understudied area of our collection in relation to whaling Scrimshaw. The museum's collection of Scrimshaw is, some say, the largest in the world and has been widely studied and published. In contrast, our Pacific Rim collections are less well understood. 
This is an important opportunity, therefore, to reframe our approach to these two collection areas through a global lens. Our speakers today consider Native Alaskan carving traditions, including Inupiat and Yupik, make Yupik makers, Native Hawaiian, Leniho Paloa, Fijian Tabua, Maori material culture, and Philippinex archives and the circulation and replication of imperialist imagery. They will share model and, excuse me, will share models for indigenous-led engagement with museum collections. The symposium aims to open a dialogue about the colonial legacies that inform collections like this and asks how can we better understand and interpret these collections from a global perspective and what can such engagements offer in the galleries and beyond as museums steward objects from around the world. This symposium is generously supported by the Terra Foundation for American Art and individual donors, and I am grateful to Sienna Weldon, who is speaking today on panel two, who was our inaugural Research and Interpretation Summer Fellow working on this material in the summer of last year, and who has graciously served as the program assistant for today's symposium, organizing travel and logistics for our speakers and the day's events. I would also like to thank our team members in visitor services, facilities, special events and public programs, and the curatorial and collections departments for planning and executing the moving pieces of this event with organization and grace, and thank you to all of you for joining us today. Our first panel of the day is, There we go. Our first panel of the day is the space of the oceans and museums. I will introduce all five speakers now. Each will come up and give their presentation. And at the end, we will take questions as a group. This is the format we'll follow for all three panels today. The first co-presenters conveniently are myself and Michael P. Dyer, our curator of maritime history. And we'll start by discussing the forthcoming summer 2024 exhibition, The Wider World in Scrimshaw, which inspired the content of today's symposium and raises questions about global material culture, colonial encounter, influence, and resilience. Renowned artist, filmmaker, and activist, Courtney Leonard, uh, an assistant professor of art and art history at St. Olaf College, and a member of the Shinnecock Nation in New York will speak about her ongoing body of work, Breach, and her interest in issues of ecology and native identity. Marina Wells is a PhD candidate in American and New England Studies at Boston University and current Curatorial Photography Collection Fellow at the New Bedford Whaling Museum. Their talk, Bending Bones, Masculinity and Materiality in the Afterlives of Whalers, Whales, excuse me, comes from their dissertation, Making Men from Whales, Whaling, Art and Gender in New England, 1840 to 1861. Finally, Michael R. Harrison, the Chief Curator and Oban Macy Research Chair at the Nantucket Historical Association, describes reconsidering Scrimshaw on Nantucket through the lens of their collection. Okay. So we're gonna segue directly into the first panel here. I'm gonna talk about the exhibit that uh, brought us all together and that Mike and I have been thinking about. Um, I'll present the first half. I'm gonna keep an eye on my time here. I'm gonna talk for about 10 minutes, show you some interesting things. He's gonna come up and talk for about 10 minutes and then we'll hand it off to our next speakers for the panel. Um, there should be plenty of time at the end of each of the panels for some healthy conversation with audience members here and on Zoom. And then at noon, we will break for lunch, which is being provided back out in Jacob's Family Gallery. So just a couple notes there. All right, so the New Bedford Whaling Museum is currently planning a major touring exhibition called The Wider World in Scrimshaw, which will open at the museum in the summer of 2024. The exhibition considers work from the museum's under-cataloged Pacific Rim collection and sets them in conversation with Yankee Whaling Scrimshaw. Through juxtaposition of objects with similar iconography, the identification of hybrid or potential hybrid works that visualize cross-cultural exchange and encounter, and the display of pieces that reveal communities looking at and picturing one another, the exhibition aims to rethink some uh, accounts of Scrimshaw and its status and foreground a global narrative of exchange and variation. Taking recent strategies uh, within the field of museums as a point of departure, Wider World aims to redefine uh, these encompassing broad global traditions of carving from across the Pacific Rim that sat in conversation with influenced and were influenced by Scrimshaw. 
Wider World contains approximately 150 items from the museum's permanent collection, and the project explores these global traditions of 19th century carving that emerged alongside traditional maritime whaling routes across the Pacific Rim. These objects are uh, evidence of the ways in which many global cultures that were central to whaling routes developed vibrant carving and decorative traditions comparable in form, material, and technique to more traditional scrimshaw. In this way, the exhibition hopes to show these relationships of uh, influence and exchange from across the Arctic, Pacific, Northwest, and Oceania. We ask, how did communities in the Pacific Rim encounter whalers and <laughs> influence the items they produced? And likewise, sorry, there's a ghost in the machine. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> and likewise, how did whaling impact these communities and their unique art forms from within and without? Okay, there we are. Wider World will occur concurrent with another temporary exhibition, Breach, a multimedia installation by Courtney Leonard that engages the legacies of whaling and cultural heritage. Breach is an ongoing exploration by Leonard of the historical and contemporary ties between place, community, whales, and the maritime environment. Um, and Leonard will speak uh, after about their own work uh, and its many rich meanings. These twinned exhibitions, we hope, will introduce the rich global legacies of whaling and maritime history and draw connections between past and present. Museum spaces often present narratives of authority and simplified singular or linear histories. Adopting one universal viewpoint, they can often be seen by visitors as objective vehicles for the dissemination of knowledge. The voice of the museum can present a dangerous kind of autonomy. As James Cuno explains, museums are, quote, used to tell the story of a nation's past and to confirm its present importance, end quote. The collections that museums, any museum, draw from are built upon hierarchies of power, economic, political, or social capital that contribute to the items one finds in a museum collection. Uh, imperialist or colonialist projects also supported and contribute to the creation of museum collections. In the book Decolonizing Museums, Amy Lone Tree explains how museums can grapple with centuries of unresolved trauma as they tell the stories of Native people, um, but we can also expand that to diverse communities. She investigates how museums can honor an indigenous worldview and way of knowing, challenge stereotypical representations, and speak the hard truths of colonization within exhibition spaces to address the persistent legacies of historical unresolved grief in Native communities. Museums are not neutral, as Latanya Autry and Mike Murawski remind us, and this is true at all museums, including at our museum. Um, it exists at all institutions that have a history and exist in the present. So to begin to decolonize a museum or collection, museums must be willing to critically examine the power dynamics that shape their history, collections, and present, since power is inherently tied to the process of colonialism. And that engagement should center diverse voices and cultures and decenter traditional uh, scholarship. Okay. So in thinking about traditional scholarship and the way in which we hope that the wider world will bring in a more kind of global narrative around these collections, one of the things to think about is certainly the way in which the perceptions of whaling and the stories of Scrimshaw have been kind of raced in the public imagination. Um, there is, one could say, a sort of assumption about perceptions of US whaling history popularly construed within the public imaginary. Um, however, that image, a sort of uh, whitening of maritime history, is far from true. U.S. whaling vessels were multicultural spaces for cultural exchange and adaptation, and crews on whaling vessels were widely diverse. They included Azorians, Cape Verdeans, Pacific Islanders, Native Americans, uh, 
black men, both free and escaped enslaved persons, working class whites, ethnic minorities, and recent immigrants from all over. And port cities like New Bedford, which was a major center of US whaling from 1800 to 1880, were global hubs where large populations interacted and contributed to a regional culture, economy, and landscape. Each global port on a whaling voyage provided opportunities to add crew and trade with different groups, and each site was an opportunity for exchange and contact. Uh, contact. So how then can we deconstruct a popular imaginary that exists in the abstract? What built-in assumptions might the museum itself passively support or help to construct related to these maritime histories? Um, the wider world in Scrimshaw aims to excavate uh, our broad global collections and put them into conversation with uh, material like Scrimshaw to engage in this broader global dialogue. Scholars of Oceania advocate a similar decentering. Um, Pacific writer and activist Apeli Hoofa calls for a reimagining of Oceania, not as islands in a far sea, but as a sea of islands, and its people as guardians of the world's ocean. Art historian Maggie Chow describes how, quote, the Oceanian worldview, which survives in legend, myths, language, and oral tradition, stretches, con stresses continuities between land and sea. To focus only on the shore as a site of exchange, is to ignore the distant and watery origins of the objects being exchanged, end quote. Indeed, oceans and the spaces within and between them are sites of active exchange and circulation of goods, people, animals, currents, and culture. Such sites, again, could reasonably be termed contact zones, these spaces where cultures meet, clash, and grapple with each other. In the exhibition, one of the first object groupings that visitors will see demonstrates cultural exchange with and Pacific Islander involvement in New England whaling ventures in the 1800s. I'm going to talk about a couple objects very briefly, and then Mike is going to come up and talk about them in more depth. Uh, but here's one group that we're really excited about looking at. These are two busks, one carved in wood that uh, Mike will describe and one carved on baleen. And it's hard to see potentially, but on the baleen busk, there is right down here, a sort of gridded rectangle of incised markings that looks very much like a Pacific Island stick navigation chart. So the question that arises, if we're looking at an object like this, we assume a whaler made it, but who was that whaler? And what do our assumptions about who that whaler was tell us about our present as much as it does about our past? Other objects like this wooden busk up in the top left, um, similarly show a decorative patterning and incision that's very traditional, uh, we see often on Fijian carved objects. Um, so where was that bust made? Who was the individual that made that? How do sitting a uh, Fijian paddle next to that busk and a stick navigation chart next to the other bus encourage audiences coming to the exhibit to hopefully reconceive or reframe how they're imagining global maritime worlds and the makers of objects like these, which is really what we hope to query. Um, there are also an incredible number of objects within the exhibition that think about domesticity, about adornment, about practices of making and creation. Um, here we see a selection of what I would deem kind of domestic objects, personal objects, each one made with diverse materials and for very particular uses, from the pie crimper in the upper left to a Fijian taboa in the upper right to a collection of carved amulets in the lower right uh, tied together with modern telephone wire to, in the lower left, uh, Leniho Paloa, made with human hair and ivory. In the exhibition, we're also certainly thinking about things made by communities explicitly for trade within maritime networks. Um, so objects like the works that we see here, which either show evidence that they are wal walrus tusks that were collected uh, in the Arctic and then inscribed and, and decorated on board a whaling vessel, or objects made by artists affiliated with the so-called Nome School of Carvers uh, in Nome, Alaska, um, to Hunter's Diary forms, like the one in the lower right, uh, which is a more traditional style of carving. 
finally, there's a section of the exhibition looking at and looking with, which includes objects um, and artworks created by whalers and by diverse communities across the Pacific Rim, uh, showing the kind of act of picturing and looking. Um, this is one spectacular example. This is a uh, uh, hiapo from Nui. This was created probably around 1880, um, and it shows incredible work um, of decoration and patterning across it, um, including the inscription of makers' names along the border and a depiction of a whaling vessel with the crew on it uh, in the lower left. So what does it mean to look at and be looked at? What does it mean to respond to uh, encounter and exchange? What does it mean across these communities uh, and within these spaces for the kinds of objects uh, that we have in our collection that we're looking at and thinking about together? Uh, these kind of slippages between seen and being seen uh, appear throughout the exhibition to destabilize assumptions about who the audience is and who the maker is, about ideas of them and us. If we go back to uh, Courtney Leonard's work, these 19th century maritime histories of colonialism endure within a global context and through contemporary relationships. The legacies of colonialism, that are explored in the exhibition Wider World prevail today. Certainly the global politics of climate change controlled by the largest nations carrying the largest carbon footprint, disempower island nations who are so-called minor polluters but are often the first to suffer. A wild world, wider world, excuse me, also aims to gesture toward these contemporary uh, issues and events by combining historical exploration with critique. And the exhibition in a twinned format with a version of Breach, which will be installed upstairs, offer a platform to engage in conversation, hopefully, with audiences and visitors around how we can take the lessons of these historical objects and bring them through to today. The goal of Wider World then is broad <laughs> and hopefully also will bring these questions to the fore as we think more deeply today and forward across the year as we work to bring this exhibition to fruition. And with that, I will hand it off to my colleague, Mike Dyer, who's going to talk about some of the spectacular objects within the exhibition and give you a bit of a deeper dive there. So thank you. I have to reiterate the welcome to everybody. Thanks for coming out. This is really, really great stuff. Uh, it, um, I'm going to be I'm going to be pretty brief here because we have we have a full day of of uh, of serious examination of of this subject. So I'm going to um, be fairly brief. Um, are we advancing using the little arrow key? Is that what we're doing? Oh, I see. All right. All right. Nah, nah, whatever. Okay. So. Um, uh, what stories can these material objects tell? Well, we can start, you know, sort of with the fact that there is a, is a, quite a story, isn't there? Uh, we're we're going to drop into Benjamin Russell in, in 1849. And so we're a good 350 years into Western experiences in this region. That's three and a half centuries. So when we start talking about whalers in the Pacific, that's late in the game. That's late in the game. But the thing to keep in mind is that it was a powerful, powerful uh, fleet of thousands of people uh, that were that were exploring everywhere from from uh, from Terra del Fuego to the Sea of Okhotsk, the whole way into the into uh, into the um, into, into the Philippines and the East Indies and Madagascar and, uh, and the South Atlantic and back again over and over and over 15,000 voyages, averaging 25 people per voyage, some as high as 35 people per voyage when you sail. So before you even sail, you got 35 guys on board. Half of those guys are going to leave. They're going to run away. 
So they're going to run away in some island paradise somewhere and wait for the next ship to come because there will be another ship. And in the meantime, who do you hire in their place? Well, you could hire some other runaway guy, or maybe, maybe you could hire some, some native who has, feels like going whaling. Um, you know? uh, but the fact is, is that it's a story. And, uh, and when Benjamin Russell painted the panorama, what did he paint for, uh, for Kila Kakua Bay? Well, he painted, he painted a, a picture, a copy of a picture that appeared in Cook's Voyages. So this is the same place where James Cook uh, met his end. Um, and, and yet, you know, so, so in the painting, we see, uh, you know, we see uh, Kila Kakua Bay painted in the Purrington and Russell's grand panorama of a whaling voyage around the world based on Cook, which appeared in a popular book which appeared in a, in a painting that traveled around the nation intending to talk people into going whaling. That was kind of the grand, I think. We, we could debate this, but I, I, have, a, I have a theory that they, were, they, they, they needed people and they were going, he was going around trying to make money with his traveling panorama, but also recruiting people to go whaling. Um, but you know, sort of in the middle of that and in the upper right, you see there's this astonishing piece of scrimshaw. It's a baleen ditty box. Um, and it's engraved with this horrific uh, but absolutely captivating scene uh, of, a, of a native islander sitting on a rock watching a burning ship. Ha. You can't get past the native islander and the ship, can you? Um, it didn't, you know, you don't have to scratch very deeply. And I didn't, right? I, uh, I, I just... I just opened American activities in the Central Pacific to something that I figured was about right, which was the New Hebrides, and landed on one entry, which said that the Cape Packet of Sydney, Australia, uh, in 1846, in May of 1846, got cut off at Sandwich Island in Vanuatu, and the natives seized all the guys, killed them all, except for, uh, killed all the white guys. The, the, the islanders they let live, and one guy escaped, and they burned the ship after taking all the iron off the hoops. And so, is that what that picture is? I don't know. Could it be? Hell yeah. Yeah, it could be. That could be exactly what it is. And that story appeared in the Sailor's Magazine, and it appeared in, in newspapers, you know, all around. And so, you, you see that, there, that we're getting into the, we're getting into some real nitty gritty stuff here where where after after 350 years you know you've got yankee whalers turning up and these people have about had it uh with that but they had iron so <clears throat> some of the forms you know the forms are great uh i don't know a, a tremendous amount about these forms uh, other than the fact that they exist and that they are they are worth talking about. So these are, again, this is from, um, oh, let's see, from Jesse to, uh, I sound choppy when I move away from the mic. So I will try not to move away from the mic. Um, uh, these these forms, the form in the center is a, is a, is a again, from Vanuatu, from the sort of, um, from that Papua New Guinea, Bismarck Archipelago, New Hebrides region. Uh, it's a it's a kind of a of a of a dance wand traditional uh, form. The 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 piece on the on the on the right, the hybrid Vanuatu club, uh, has this trade axe head on it. This is not a war club. This is not intended for uh, for for combat. Uh, it's got, but it has this fabulous trade axe. You just think about the concept of a trade axe for a second and the significance that that could hold to people that never had such a thing before. And uh, you could use it for, you know, chopping stuff up. You could use it in warfare. You could also use it as a, as a, as a powerful symbol of the, of the power of iron itself. Uh, and incorporate it into your own culture, which is what you see in this stylized, hy stylized hybrid axe head dance wand from the region of Papua New Guinea, where it's in made entirely out of wood. So the whole thing's made out of wood. There's no iron in it at all. It's just absorbed this. It's a, it's a representative of, of a culture that has absorbed 
everything that's coming into it and is now represented part of that. Um, these, these kinds of objects, you know, I, I, I'd love to engage in a, in a, in a, in a much you know, deeper conversation about them because I think, I think they it most definitely warrant it. Um, you know, we know about the Marquesas Islands, you know, uh, Porter's Journal of a Cruise uh, during the War of 1812 highlighted this place that there was a, uh, that, you know, the, the harbor at Nukuhiva was a, was it was a good harbor. There were, there were, uh, there were people there. Um, and, uh, and he, and he talked extensively, you know, in the book about these people, um, which, you know, it would eventually, uh, you know, it would eventually become popularized by, by Herman Melville's uh, Herman Melville's Taipei, you know, where, you know, the man who lived among the cannibals, right? So, so there's a popular novel by the 1840s that anybody can read. You know, you don't have to go out and read Porter's Journal of a Cruise, which, you know, unless you're into it, will put you straight to sleep. You can read instead about Taipei, which will not put you to sleep uh, because it's got all kinds of groovy stuff in it. Um, and, but along the way, of course, the same way that Cook's voyages influenced later voyages all around the region by mapping and charting and describing, Porter's Journal did the same thing. Hundreds of Yankee whalers visited this area, and uh, and you know as a result, you know somewhere along the line, a Marquesian artist took it upon themselves to carve a fid. Um, you know, a fid is just a regular old sailor's tool. They use it for everything. You use it for opening knots. You can use it to uh, to uh, to tie uh, grommets and sailcloth. A fid is just a tool. It's just a, a regular common tool. Every sailor has one. Um, sometimes steel ones are called marlin spikes, but um, but this is a bone one made out of uh, the you know, hand bone, jaw bone of a sperm whale. Um, but the but the Marquesian one is completely useless. You can't use it for anything. Why not? Why can't you use it for anything? It's not smooth, right? It's art now. Right? You can't, you know, you can't, you can't do any work with that. So it becomes an art form. Another way uh, in which Yankee whalers really greatly impacted the economy of the Pacific was the fact that they that these sperm whale teeth were a traded commodity amongst the islands. They were very powerful things. These are not whaling people. So the, the peoples of the Central Pacific do not go out and hunt and kill whales. Uh, whales periodically will wash ashore, at which point bits and pieces of them can be extracted and traded. And uh, and the teeth of sperm whales were among the more powerful such such commodities and they were made into uh into the famous uh necklaces tambua necklaces and these necklaces had great significance in society at the time and i believe that they 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 still do today however um, as more whalers in particular uh, are, are, are trading around the region, traveling around the region. They've got more sperm whale teeth than they know what to do with. And so they're flooding the market with sperm whale teeth. And, uh, and you know, the, 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 the engraved one here in the lower right, isn't that an interesting thing? Was it engraved, a piece of engraved scrimshaw that was traded in Fiji? Just traded it and said, you know, here, here's this great teeth and I'll take some, some, I'll take a nice pig for that, if you please. Or was it, uh, or or was it, you know, engraved there? I mean, who knows? Uh, but you know, the, the the top piece, you know, this William E. Belena Suva piece, you know, has much much stronger, um, uh, potentially much much stronger direct relevance to the to to the people of the island uh, than than the Scrimshaw piece does. So, um, you know, whalers upset the economies of the Pacific with the, with the influx of sperm whale teeth. Um, you know, the busk, busks are fabulous. You know, we've got a great exhibit of busks upstairs. You can go spend your day looking at busks. They're great. Um, and there's a lineage to busks. And here, you know, in, 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 in uh, Southeastern Massachusetts, we have some, we have some wooden ones. 
uh, like the one on the top, um, which is just a just a maple busk, and it's and it's engraved with geometric forms, and it says 1763, and it's got a heart on it, and it's got a topsail uh, sloop, and a, a, a picture of a of a woman. Um, and moving down, there's a, there's a mahogany one is is next. So mahogany is as Dan Finmore can tell you, you know, there's a deep trade in mahogany that goes back into the 18th century and maybe even a little bit before that. But mahogany ain't maple. It's not birch. It's not coming from your woods. It's coming from out there in the world somewhere. It's got, it, there's something special to it. The next piece down uh, has a, a much, um, a much finer, has a much finer schooner to it than this sort of gouged out sloop on the top. Uh, much more reminiscent of Scrimshaw, much more reminiscent of the kinds of things, kind of engraving that is beginning to come out of the whale fishery in the early 19th century, such as the next piece down, which is a you know, stunning example of, of whaleman's work. You know, it's a, it's, a, it's a piece of pan bone, you know, it's a piece of the jaw of a sperm whale and it's beautifully engraved with, uh, with scenes of shipping at sea. What about the last one? What a weird thing that is. That's a chip carved piece of maple or birch. The carving on it strongly resembles Austral Island's paddle carving, not only in the technique of the carving, but also in this, in this what looks like a heart motif. But when, uh, but when you get the opportunity to actually examine the, the knob handles of Austral Island's paddles, you will see some of them have tiki face figures. Some of them have stylized female figures with splayed legs, and they go around the edge of the knob. And that is actually what, what that is. It's not, it's not a heart the way we, we see hearts on Scrimshaw. It's something else. So... Was this some Yankee guy copying Austral Island's paddle carving? Or was it an Islander copying a Yankee, uh, 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 an American um, sort of social technique of, of the demonstration of love between a man and a woman? Uh, well, uh, it's worth thinking about. And that's what this exhibit is going to be about. You know, along the same lines is this baleen, uh, you know, the Naomi, Naomi touched on this, this baleen uh, uh, busk up here and, and this aboriginal tooth, each share these paired triangular sails. Um, and uh, you, know, you can't look at that baleen uh, busk and not wonder what the heck it is. Uh, and, you know, it was my brainwave as I'm looking at this thing and I thought, wow, that, that actually looks like one of those stick charts from the from, uh, you know, from the Marshall Islands, um, that the engraving that's on there. And what about those triangles? Doesn't that look like that Aboriginal tooth? I don't know, folks. I don't know who engraved it. I don't know why they engraved it. That was it a native person that engraved that? I mean, it's not, this is not super fine scrimshaw. You know, this is not like top drawer, beautiful scrimshaw, but it opens up these questions about the influence of whaling in the Pacific and the people that are there and cultural exchange. So, um, so these are, these are the, the ideas that we're going to be exploring a bit more in the exhibit. Um, as, uh, as, as Naomi pointed out earlier, you know, this, uh, this fabulous Chapo, how is that island pronounced? Nui, right. So uh, circa 1880s, you know, late 19th century, this is a, uh, this is a, not an entirely a traditional form with this, you know, pic picture of a of a of a Western square rigger sort of built into into the form uh, in a in a piece of top of cloth. Um, so you, you know, there's a, there is a lot to talk about, and uh, you know, as time goes on, these cultural overlaps become less and less surprising to me, uh, and uh, and we will we will see that in the Arctic. By the mid 20th century, um, uh, I'm sure that Igor will uh, will work on some of these ideas, um, uh, really sort of in depth. Um, but the, but the art forms that begin coming out of the Arctic do not resemble their traditional art forms at all, except the material that they're done on. And so you you see a uh, an honest to goodness total change over time. Uh, that is cross-cultural. It's um, 
you can't you can't help it. Um, you know this this you know this dinky little this dinky little model of a of a of a toggle harpoon. It's the things only this big, uh, but you know uh, Native Alaskans make models of all kinds of stuff. They make model polar bears and model wolverines and model foxes and model birds and uh, and whales as talisman to carry with them when they actually go out and hunt whales or to hunt seals. Uh, and you see these things uh, in in a variety of different forms. And that one is a very late Yankee whaling toggle harpoon, which are actually in use by native hunters to this very day. So there's a there is a guy in central Pennsylvania who actually makes those things and sells them to uh, to Arctic whalers. Um, and they're just the same model that was made right across the street. It was either right across the street or right where we're sitting. I can't remember. The, the shoulder guns were made right where I'm standing. Right across the street was where the uh, was where the toggle harpoons were made. Um, this you know this darting gun iron. You can tell it's a darting gun iron because it has that loop at the end. This is not a thrown harpoon. Uh, it's fired from a darting gun, which this young man is holding. So there's the darting gun, and that uh, that little loop gets the uh, gets the whale line, and that little uh, little piece of iron there uh, goes into a pair of loops right here. And there's a bomb lance in here, and this is the trigger mechanism. It's a great way to kill whales. It's not the traditional way to kill whales, um, which was, uh, you know, this ancient, fabulous walrus ivory, fossilized walrus ivory and slate stone whaling harpoon uh, from the from uh, from Alaska, from the Alaska region, and that type worked. It worked great. Worked great for a long time. It worked so well that native the native people figured we'll just, we'll just keep that, but we'll take the steel that these guys have, and we'll replace the stone with the steel. So the the type itself worked great, but but it's improved. Time marches on. And. Uh, and time marches on as well with these, you know, with these pipe forms, you know, the upper left hand corner there, that's a, that's a, that's a great, you know, sort of traditional Siberian type of, of, uh, you know, Chukchi, uh, Chukotka kind of a, kind of a pipe form, uh, which is mirrored um, on, on uh, by the piece on the right, except the piece on the right is a souvenir. So it's, it's, it's carved, it's engraved in this, in this way of uh, really significant record keeping, pictorial record keeping that uh, that was so common to the hunters on the North Slope and elsewhere in, in Alaska, but the form itself uh, now becomes a tradable tobacco pipe. Uh, and the piece in the lower left looks like a pipe, you know, in, in its regular form that you could go down the street and 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 buy at the at the tobacconist, uh, except that it's made out of walrus ivory. And so you can see that these forms uh, are evolving over time. So um, that's what I have for you today. Um, I think, uh, let's see, we got a panel. Panel panel one is coming up, and I, I believe May, um, I believe, let's see, Courtney M. Leonard, breach. Courtney Leonard, there she is. Hi, Courtney. Thank you all very much for your attention. Uh, all right, uh, Tabutni Hakami, thank you for having me here today. Um, I am going to try to be mindful of my time, but I tend to go over much like um, a long journey. I guess I should be like over here. Is my New York voice not loud enough? All right, here we go. Um, so I was told to do this. There we go. Uh, all right, so I'm uh, Shinnecock, I'm from Long Island, New York. Um, I'm joining you today though from, by way of Minnesota. I currently am in Minnesota teaching at a college called St. Olaf College. And um, I am honored to be here. Uh, this is um, 
a lot of different communities, um, but Wampanoag community, um, I want to acknowledge um, someone in the audience, Elizabeth Perry and her mother as well, is here. Um, so, uh, and my mom's here too, somewhere. Unless she, yep, okay. <laughs> like, unless she left, she's been to a lot of talks. Um, but uh, I just want to center myself with like where I am and my relationship to uh, Long Island and Shinnecock and its translation in English is um, uh, understood as people of the level land or people of the water. So um, we're water people, um, we're connected to this place um, in a lot of different ways. And a part of it is some of what was referenced in the previous um, uh, discussions uh, in regards to Yankee whaling. Um, our men, as well as a lot of different indigenous uh, communities, coastal communities along this area, were hired on for our knowledge um, and our wherewithal in relationship to whales um, for that Yankee whaling uh, industry. And um, our men would be gone for a long period of time. And I think I have that kinship and understanding with my practice as well, um, realizing that my 12-year-old daughter, uh, this is her spring break, and, um, and her mother is uh, working. Um, so, uh, so this is kind of something that you'll see some parallels between who we are as a people and how we continue um, our ways of sharing and our ways of acknowledging and honoring uh, that of the whale, um, which is a part of our kinship and family relationships. Uh, how does that tie to the word that you see up here on the slide, breach? Uh, English is an imposed language on our community. Um, there are a lot of different uh, communities that have been working for quite some time uh, to keep what language we have left, as well as language revitalization programs for our youth. And so when I think of using English, I think of this situation where I'm continuously empowering a language that does not deserve that empowerment. Uh, and what is it about English that sometimes even as we use it, we may not understand the layers of what it engages with. So breach, for instance, is an act of breaking or failing to observe a law or agreement. I hope you understand that in relationship to indigenous issues. Uh, breach is also a gap in a wall or a barrier or defense. It can be both a noun and a verb of action in a different, um, different means of possibilities. Uh, breach is also, for many of you here today, something you might be familiar with when we see a whale is when it breaches and rises above the water. The whale is there, though, all the time, um, but we tend to only acknowledge it when we see it. I find um, that to be a very strong metaphor for Indigenous communities and issues. Uh, and I found empowerment between weaving in my understanding and relationship to breach uh, to our current issues that we're facing today in a hope of um, recognition and um, what people are talking more about lately, allyship towards these greater issues without continuing to silence our voices or not bring us to the table um, in terms of the knowledge that we have to offer. So. Uh, so I'm an artist. Uh, I'm not going to, I'm going to talk as who I am. <laughs> um, I'm a visual person and this is how I see. I see and I relate. And I think I understood that in understanding our men when they would write the letters back home that we have in our nation's uh, collection. Um, that was a vision, like, I mean, not a vision, that was like a thing that I saw, um, this tactile form of letter writing and documenting to home these stories when they were on these uh, legs. Um, when you go into a collection, you may see different things. I see things that often I don't touch because I don't know what they were used for, and I don't know what energy they hold, and um, I'm concerned a little bit about what is in collections that actually should not be there. Um, this is a whaler's log book. Um, when I tried to explain to art historians or I don't know, curators and stuff, what I was doing. Uh, they usually like to know um, like how it is that I'm an artist that does a lot of different mediums and materials. Sometimes artists will get typecast and they have to make the same thing over and over again for the rest of their life. That's not me. Um, I realized that there was um, a poignant connection to that uh, Yankee uh, whale boat 
and the logging of a visual account, which was that logbook. It was a document for the bank, but it was also a way of seeing and acknowledging. And then in some relationships, depending on what journals you would read, um, they got a little bit um, emotional. There was some emo writing as well. Um, so this is uh, showing you the account, uh, the stamps uh, taking in of those whales numbered. I would like you to look at how I see an account, scale, numbers, mass, when I'm showing you these images. Um, I'd also like you to see and acknowledge that depending on what culture and community you come from, you are engaging with the cultural landscape that is of your place. Um, and there is a way in which you are seeing and documenting and preserving that narrative for your community and for your people. Maybe it's in your clothes. Um, maybe it's the vehicle that you're driving, but all of those are entry points into an acknowledgement and engagement of place and time. Uh, this is Dutch Delft Word Tile. So if you are familiar with the history of Long Island, um, the English and the Dutch um, settled and uh, they, our majority of our treaties or uh, relationships um, were with those entities, those nations, nation to nation agreement. Um, previous to the US government forming. Um, I'm offering that to you without teaching you all of American history, which you should have been taught already, uh, inclusive of indigenous histories, is that um, we were what was considered a state recognized nation up until 2010, when President Obama's administration um, afforded us after a 60 year battle, um, the uh, federal recognition designation. Um, I'm offering that to you and you can dive a little bit deeper in relationship to that of the whale. The whale is federally protected. Um, our community did not have an entry point of access to that of the cultural material of the whale legally under this imposed law until 2010. It also opened up a lot of different uh, segments into uh, coastal erosion, mass hurricanes, big nor'easters coming through when we have coastal erosion and uh, climate issues that people don't wanna necessarily talk about, um, those are affecting us in terms of emergency funding and ability to um, use that res those resources to help our coast. Uh, so a Delft word tile, a Minoan Greek um, vessel, uh, the Minoan, um, the Greek vessel, this shape I wanna acknowledge is very similar to our Eastern, um, what's referred to as Eastern Algonquin pottery. So another person I'd like to acknowledge who I consider my clay elder, um, someone I highly respect is Ramona Peters. Um, her work is in the gallery upstairs and, um, and our pots from this area carry that same shape of the seed. Um, it has a relationship to um, female. It is a, there's a lot of different depth to the way that um, the design of it is also like making a good stew pot. You know, it's funny when you talk about water that you need water. Um, so, uh, so how do we see, how do we document and what do we document with? Um, that is another entry point I wanna acknowledge is that I came from a community um, where because of this imposition of law, we didn't have access to um, baleen bone uh, teeth. Um, after the, um, I don't know, 60s, 70s. But our um, activeness in uh, whaling went up until the 1910s, 1920s off of Sag Harbor whaling when that was shut down. Um, so in 2005, the first time I was ever with a whale was when a 50 ton, uh, 40 foot finback whale was struck by a shipping boat and its um, body had washed ashore on Dune Roadside. So Shinnecock, I'll show you a map in a second. Um, there's a bay and then there's a dune road and there's all the mansions. So my bay neighbor is Calvin Klein. Um, and uh, before that it was the DuPont mansion and um, there's a lot of history to that road. Uh, when the whale comes, which is kind of now when they're coming up from Florida up to Bay of Fundy, um, I don't know if you are familiar. I think most of you are kind of knowledgeable to bring you here today, but we've had about 23 whales um, and dolphins die since December. 
Um, and that is still an ongoing uh, discussion as to what's occurring, but the majority of those whales were struck by ships. Um, so when I was with that whale, um, I had myself been struck. I was in a really bad car accident and I, was, um, I needed to learn to walk again. I uh, was working with Southampton College with a um, anthropologist, John Strong, um, to do a cross-cultural uh, class on Algonquin pottery and Shinnecock pottery. And um, I had that car accident. Uh, my mother brought a bag of clay um, for me to the water. And I sat with the whale and I coiled this whale tail and it speaks to some past work that I would create that was coiling uh, the tail of the whale and our men as whalers. And that was an earlier um, stretch of work. I didn't realize at that moment that about 10 years later, I would create a piece in response to that time, which is called breach number two. Um, it is a palette of sperm whale teeth that I have fashioned out of clay which is a material that I do have access to. So I do a lot of thinking through materiality access, and I understand that clay itself also is a part of an extractive system. So if you don't necessarily know where you're getting your materials from, you are a part of that system. When I think about extraction and import and export, and that the majority of whales killed per year are struck by our shipping industry, um, that is what came to thinking about, am I the artist that makes scrimshaw? No. Why is that? What is it that I'm doing? I'm thinking through a question in my practice, which is can a culture sustain itself when it no longer has access to the environment that fashions that culture? Are we still Shinnecock people if we are no longer by the water, the people of the shore, the people of the land? What is it, um, what is it about what we're going through that defines who we are in relationship to place? Um, so, Breach number two is about 48 to 60 teeth, which is the lower jaw of a sperm whale fashioned out of clay. It sits on a shipping pallet to mark not only the idea of access of materiality and that lack of um, being able to through the imposition of these laws, um, but also the, the act of what actually killed or kills the whales, um, which is that of our shipping, our pallets. Uh, I'm gonna go back to this image. At the time that I made this around 2014, 15, um, it's an ongoing discussion, but there were these uh, uh, reactions to the ivory industry in relationships to elephant harvesting. Um, this particular image is a plaza in Paris, um, right below the Eiffel Tower, where they would take the elephant ivory and place it on a blue tarp and crush all of it as a response to stopping um, poaching of elephants. Um, I don't negate the abuse of subsistence harvesting um, in terms of it should not occur, but the fact that the ivory laws are infringing on indigenous relationships and rights for use is something of great conflict when people want to protect things. They don't actually understand the layers and the relationship that these indigenous people, our communities have to protecting that of a species that is our inner relationship of place and belonging um, for, cent for centuries. Um, so what is it to have an abundance of material and then crush it? Uh, and then that also was a part of bringing into what I have access to and what I'm trying to create and being able to even be here with all of you today. I'm really uh, thankful because Generationally, not a lot of our communities engaged in this space. And I think that that was what um, Naomi was saying with now these conversations of books of talking about how you should bring people in. Um, honestly, you should bring people in because we see things that you may not see. Um, and we know things that you may not know. Uh, so, um, and we are the people that they came from. So like, you should ask, I always thought if you're gonna learn about a people, you should learn from the people themselves. So that was my biggest pursuit in my entry point to my work was if this is happening in my community um, and I'm not being heard, we're not being heard, then there's other coastal communities that aren't being heard as well. And what should I do to further understand that? And I'm on a learning journey myself. I don't know everything. Um, so every ounce of support, um, financial support my family would have and community support through fundraising um, 
I put into traveling to the places that my community went to. So I've been up to Mi'kmaq territory, um, the path of the whale. Um, I'm gonna show you a couple of images, but this image is a couple of postcards that I picked up when I was going through uh, Fiji on the way to Aotearoa um, for an invitation from um, an artist and community. So the artist is Manos Nathan, who's Maori, um, and the community is in North Island. Um, Nagapuhi is where we were first for the Indigenous Artists Exchange, and this was in 2014, because that's when I got married and my anniversary, I mean, your honeymoon, I went by myself for this Indigenous Artists Exchange <laughs> because we didn't have enough money for both of us to go. Um, side story. So anyway, <laughs> um, Manos, um, let me see. Um, I, I think I have it in here, but um, I was bound for a journey. And I also, this, most of my work sometimes is, um, I'm just going to go back because I'm not sure how I timed these. Yeah, so it was bound for a journey and I was also creating um, a painting. Uh, this is called Bound. Uh, so it's the one, um, I think it's stuck. All right, so the word bound is weird. You can be physically bound for something, going somewhere, but you can also actually be bound and tied. Um, so this piece is called Bound. It was a image of a humpback whale that was um, bound by the crab trap lines, um, the lines that were left behind from the ghost traps off of um, Hawaii. And I had seen uh, that on a newscast when I was about to present um, Breach and that um, uh, palette of whale teeth. Um, I also made this piece before I was bound for a journey on the Charles W. Morgan um, as a part of the Voyagers, uh, the 30th Voyager. So that was also, I need to acknowledge Jason Mancini, um, whose work is in Indian Mariners, uh, for connecting me and encouraging me to apply to that. Um, when I was on that ship, I was a little worried because um, everybody was like, really knowledgeable about tall ships and sailing. And um, sailing when you grow up in the Hamptons is um, you gotta have money sometimes to sail. Um, and I didn't really have that. So I didn't really grow up with learning how to go offshore and sail. My brother though, who's a deep sea diver and marine biologist, he put his all into that. So he did have some sailing knowledge. Um, so when I was on that ship, I questioned why I'm there and if I should be there. Um, what I realized, because I got to spend a night in July extra because of a storm that was coming through, I spent the night in the hull and I just listened to the ship. And um, I, used, I took sound recordings and it led into a video that I called Memory. And it was a relationship of me coiling and the men and the people, or not just the men, it was, um, a, it was a lot of different people holding the line and they would go, hold the line and they would start rigging the ship. And as I watched all of that handwork, I realized that that handwork is something I have familiarity to when I'm coiling. Uh, so I did this dual video projection um, of memory and holding the line. Um, this is Rangi Kippa. He's a master carver and art artist. Um, he's one of the artists that was at the exchange in 2014. I keep nodding to Elizabeth because Elizabeth has also been a part of the exchanges as well. And, um, and we got a chance to be with one another um, at Evergreen College um, a few years ago um, for one of the exchanges where people are coming from different territories to different regions. And the idea is that by us being together, we can continue to empower each other and build our connections and pass that on to future generations. So we don't quite feel so alone. Um, but this image, um, Rangi's a big guy and he was a little bit intimidating, but we eventually became cool friends. And um, the Waseka that was in the previous image on that postcard in Fiji, um, I wanted to see if I could um, honor that. And when I got there, Manos gave us clay from New Zealand, and which is porcelain. Um, New Zealand has a, a good primary clay. And then um, there was also clay from Australia that was gifted to us to use. And then I shaped them into the teeth. And then Rangi um, had done some of the surface design. But you can see how intricate his carvings are. So this is Manos and um, 
uh, Manos, there was something that someone said about um, the environment and the impact. Um, Manos is um, Greek and um, Maori, and he um, very much talked about that um, in relationship to his work um, and also his family's um, uh, advocation and protection of the Kodi um, uh, gum trees, which have a connection to the whales. Um, so when I arrived there, he knew about me, he knew about my relationship, my community, not being able to have access to the whales. Um, and he took me the next day uh, to the Cody Forest, but then that night he gifted me um, um, my Tonga um, and that I have not um, taken off since he gave it to me. Um, and he wanted to give it to me in the woods, in the Cody Forest to talk about the relationship of the whale there. Um, he has passed away of cancer. Um, there is a high rate of cancer in um, different areas that often are very environmental areas that protect their areas. The ozone is depleted in those areas because of other people's abuse, collective abuse of that depletion. So I don't know if you're familiar with Maine, but Maine has a high depletion of an ozone layer. Um, a lot of that is coming from New York industry going up that way and depleting it. Um, there's also other issues with cattle and offset running uh, water that relates to the cancer rates as well. Um, but uh, I just wanted to take this time in this wider world of scrimshaw to really talk about the people that are a part of Breach and um, this logbook journey, this visual account that I'm on, because I wouldn't be here today if it wasn't for who I am and where I come from and also um, the people that have honored me as a part of this journey. Um, so we're gathered um, beneath one of the massive um, trees um, uh, and it's about coming together. Um, Breach is also about these log books. So every year I explain what I do through a log book. It's a visual account. So I've been doing log books for 10 years now. Um, so log book 22, 23. Um, at some point in one of the log books, I did a series called Abundance, um, which was in relationship to mass fish dyes that have been occurring because of nitrogen runoff, also because of warming waters and predatory fish, um, the uh, kind of the um, pushing them into shallower waters and then they lose oxygen before the high tide and low tides can bring them back out. Um, so what is it to have an abundance of fish or to be able to fill your basket? Um, sometimes you can't actually physically fill it because of that issue. I am weaving these all in clay so they are strong enough to be hung up like cod on a nautical map for where the whales would go. Um, but they would never actually function as well. So the, the tie between environmental fragility with clay is something that I think about. Um, also, if you got to dry your basket in New England, you hang it up. Um, so uh, this is another um, thing that I wanted to talk about today is that there are a lot of people that support and give money to um, Sea Shepherd, PETA, different things to protect and save the whales. Um, Sea Shepherd in particular and Paul Watson in 2016 cyberbullied an Inupiaq youth um, for um, their ability to hunt and feed their community. Um, I understand there's probably different mindsets in this room in terms of that. I would just ask if you've never actually been to that territory and you don't actually know that community and those people, you shouldn't judge them in terms of what their responsibility is versus yours. If the majority of whales that kill per year are struck by our industry, um, if you're getting a couch from somewhere, I doubt you made it. Um, so the likelihood is that you've contributed to the cause and effect of mass whale dies. Um, so what the community had to do was they put forth a whereas clause where that community could no longer post on social media when they're hunting. Now, if you look at social media, a good majority of it is what you ate for lunch. Um, but our communities can't live in our joy and our ability to feed our communities for generations because of this imposition and this perceived ideology of who should be doing what and who shouldn't in relationship to food. And if people think about the carbon footprint cause and effect, um, our areas of the earth are melting, 
what can't get over these mass water lagoons that should be frozen seasonally um, have to come in by plane or by boat and that further increases the carbon footprint. Um, so what I wanted to show though is that feeding yourself, feeding your family is a space of joy. Um, that the image above in the middle is my daughter at um, the clam bake. Um, <laughs> uh, so I was with a, at a clam bake with um, Elizabeth, her mother, Jonathan and uh, Leah, per um, uh, Leah. And um, they were talking about food sovereignty and indigenous food sovereignty. And it was something that my daughter has full joy about. So we went clam digging that day and then brought it in. It was a whole day, seven to seven at night, um, but it was good and it was joyful. Um, I'm, I think I'm going close on my time. So I just wanna acknowledge the joy. I wanna acknowledge what food sovereignty means. I wanna acknowledge um, what our shipping ports and industry actually looks like when it comes into San Francisco and New York and then gets put on rails and be brought into the interior. Um, I wanna acknowledge that there is a conversation about ghost traps, it is getting a bit better. Um, but uh, this was one of the more recent logbooks called Nebulous at the Hood um, that was looking at when I was uh, following an oyster guy, uh, Mike Martinson and Montauk Pearls and understanding what we leave behind. I use installations as a way to enter into an environment, um, hoping that people will kind of come into that and teach me as well as to what they see. Um, I was asked, I was commissioned to do work for the Metropolitan Museum of Art. I had hoped that they would have acquired this painting um, because it was a um, conversation uh, piece that I created called Collider um, during the pandemic. I was thinking about this pandemic time and the collision of events that we have been um, witnessing and coming out of. Um, I thought a lot about whale fall and the idea of death, what happens to us when we die. Um, and is death really a closure or is death a continuity? And in terms of whale fall, whale fall, if you allow the whale to um, be on the shore without moving it because you're worried about your Hampton summer and its decay, it feeds a whole ecological system that we have offset for generations because of our concerns of the dead whale rotting and the stink and the smell and the stench. Inupiaq people don't do that. They bring the whales out to um, Point Hope and the polar bears that everybody's worried about is starving, they all feed and everything feeds off of that. So that's a shared reciprocity of survivance that nobody talks about in relationship to indigenous knowledge. Um, so Collider, this is tofu. Um, tofu is an articulated juvenile humpback whale that's hanging at a marine center in Maine. It, it was where my brother got married and I'm always doing research. So I was taking photos of tofu and learning about tofu and tofu was struck by a boat. Um, I painted tofu into this piece called Collider and also thinking about the issues of opioid um, hitting our communities on the East Coast and the introduction of poppy. Um, I was looking at when I Googled Shinnecock that the only person that came up was William Merritt Chase when there's so many prolific people from our community. Um, so how is it that someone else who's not Shinnecock gets acknowledged when people want to search Shinnecock? Um, and the only thing I thought about William Merritt Chase was, well, he really likes to use red in terms of his compositional pull. He will navigate you through like those charts. He will navigate you through with little points of red in his landscape. So that's all I'll take from him. Um, and then I should continue. This is more recent um, where I'm not carving the tooth, but I'm layering it with the layers of history and understanding. So I did a little bit of Dutch Delftware blue. It's micaceous clay that comes from, um, the mica actually comes from China. It's a clay body that's made in Albuquerque, um, but they use local clay, but they wanna make a clay body that when people wanna learn flameware and micaceous pottery for tourism, that they give them a lot of mica. In order to give them a lot of mica, they import the mica from China and they embed it into the clay itself where mica usually is just used as a slip on the surface of micaceous traditional pottery. Um, so I'm using that industrial, like kind of that man-made artificial mica clay body. I'm coiling it. And this is Deb Holland, who's the um, our first indigenous department of the interior um, uh, ever 
woman, <laughs> like from Laguna Pueblo. So a bit of Laguna Pueblo is there, a bit of China is there. And I wanted to acknowledge her as Scrimshaw Study Logbook 2021 um, on one side of the tooth. On the other side of the tooth is um, how the whales during our time of quiet came back to the Hudson, came back to Manhattan, have been coming back more so. So if you think through the layers of why whales are actually being struck and killed right now, because three years they had peace where we weren't having an increase of shipping and now we're going back to norm. And so all of those like generations that were born and going up to the Bay of Fundy, they're now in conflict with us coming back to massive industry. That's my take. I'm not a scientist. I'm just an artist, but I, because I'm an artist, I get to say what I want. Um, so uh, I'll continue by saying another piece that I created is called um, Contact 2009. It's looking at our um, relationship to wampum and trade. When people talk about American history and they talk about wampum and treaties, they mainly talk about the Haudenosaunee Six Nation um, Confederacy. Um, they hardly ever talk about where the shells come from. The shells come from us because biologically those shells, that purple and white, it doesn't exist anywhere else. So if people actually dug deeper into their research, they would understand where ecological um, location comes from. Um, and the fact that that alone shows how we've been rewritten out of history. And why are we being rewritten? Like, why are we being written out of history? It's because we are still here and we're living in a beautiful place that people want. So it's easier to get rid of us than it is to support us. Um, so I have placed my thumbprint into my versions of clay uh, shells. Um, I colored the porcelain. The porcelain is that New Zealand porcelain that I'm talking about. And I made over 3,000 of my thumbprints that I wove into a six foot by six foot um, map of New York, but specifically the Hudson, because I wanted to acknowledge that river going down to the coast. And within each of those um, thumbprints, I'm also acknowledging layers of community and connection. That's Joanne Shenandoah. Um, that's Grogu, and Grogu got me through uh, COVID. Um, there's also uh, Pete Jones, who is another potter from Onondaga, who I consider another clay elder of mine. And uh, I'm almost done. So that's Pete, and I was really honored that Pete's uh, work is also on view at the Met until April 2nd. I think they're changing it out. And you can visit um, Contact. And this is my daughter on the right-hand side with breach number two. Um, and that's William Merritt Chase's painting that needs to be turned around, um, but it's of Shinnecock Bay. So, um, so the only thing that I wanted to kind of close with is that not many women were on these ships. There are some that you will hear about in stories and people are writing about that. Um, but usually it was the captain's wife. Usually it was um, uh, people in disguise. Um, and uh, I think a lot about that in relationship to being a mother. And um, my daughter was born in 2010 when we had the Gulf oil spill. Um, I was able to bring her to see our presence in museums. And I wanted to say what that means is um, I know museums are a white box space and maybe aren't deserving of our time, like in terms of indigenous people at this point. Um, but I, I, I worried when I was younger that when I was asked to do a school project about Shinnecock and I would look it up, it was always written by somebody not from our community. And they would always write about how we all died on the Circassian and the last of our sperm died with those men that died on the Circassian, which is a cargo ship and you can look it up. But how history is written is something that I hope is being countered with this work. And I spent a lot of time donating for each work to museums to counter our community being documented in those spaces. Um, and I, it is important to me, I don't sign the work of Breach. I feel like if I could put everyone's signatures on Breach, that is what Breach is. Um, so Breach is Manos, Breach is, um, uh, like the Perry's breaches, like it breaches everything. 
breach is because nobody else takes time to include us and um, until more so now. But I hope that that continues. And I hope that people understand that all as important as your voices are in your research, you should be doing it with the people themselves. Um, so thank you. Good morning, everyone. Should we try that again? Good morning, everyone. Right. Um, it's such an honor to be up here. Thank you to my fellow panelists. Um, wonderful talks and really looking forward to a whole day of wonderful talks. Um, so I'm here in both my capacities as a curatorial fellow in the photography collection at the New Bedford Whaling Museum, and um, as a PhD candidate at Boston University studying things like whaling art. Um, and so the lenses I bring to this conversation, I think, relate to masculine identity, sort of these constructs of masculine identity in the 19th century as they relate to what we think of as Yankee scrimshaw, as well as the materiality of it. So ivory, bone, baleen, and other parts of one's living beings. And I'm hoping to sort of think through with you all today, not only in my presentation, but all day long about our current cultures of display as well, how we think about these things, how we put them into uh, museum spaces and so on. So. Today, I will not be taking up the task of uh, sort of explaining the association with between men and the sea, right? This is merely a staple of our culture that is while deeply embedded, not natural. And so I'll leave it to other historians and gender theorists to explain that. Um, but instead, I'm interested in the sort of homosocial world of whaling that is by the 19th century, it's very established. Um, as a men's only space, and um, also how whaling took materials of other beings' bodies and created different kinds of uh, gendered objects with them. So how might this medium, the bodies themselves, material, materially misalign with Scrimshaw's intentions, both in the past when they were originally made and also how um, we can approach this in the present. So I admittedly do tend to look at the, the heyday of the age of sale, this sort of traditional idea of this economic sweet spot for New Bedford as we think about it, for example, kind of between the Napoleonic Wars and the American Civil War, when the world wandering whale ships profited immensely from extractive practices um, and this produces what we think of as a sort of 19th century oil industry for light and lubrication. And in some ways, I do think of my role here today as establishing, um, as sort of covering this established narrative that uh, maybe we all have in common, but just to kind of set the ground, the sort of foundational ideas here of um, this Melvillian narrative. Um, so this industry produces what we think of as byproducts, as um, the carved pieces of whale teeth and bone, and this practice that became more common after American traders, as Mike alluded to earlier, sort of exploited the value of whale teeth in the Fijian islands where they've been used as sacred tambua. Um, so I suspect that'll be discussed in a later panel as well. But so around the 1820s or so, whale teeth kind of change in value and become canvases for whalemen to scratch into. And if there's a canon of these early scrimshaw artists carving ivory and bone, I think Frederick Myrick is in it. Over the course of a few months on a return voyage from the Pacific on the Nantucket ship Susan, Myrick engraved at least 35 of these teeth, which totals nearly the entirety of what 
one jawbone, what a single whale would have in their jaw, um, tending to be about 42 teeth totaling there. Um, so his formulaic teeth scenes include for ship portraits and whaling scenes, and also they tend to have an inscription along the lines of death to the living, long life to the killers, success to sailors' wives, and greasy luck to whalers. And I think it's worthwhile to sort of pause and sit with this because um, we kind of take this kind of object for granted, I think, some of us. And Myrick's exceptional here for his consistent use of this inscription. and. It brings about a sort of multifaceted understanding of the industry, especially in terms of how we think about gender there and um, the identity it produces. So for one, the lines death to the living and long life to the killers, of course, highlight this fatal violence that is inherent to the industry, as well as the risk that the violence could be sort of turned on its head, right? Um, that a man and a whale are on two sides of a coin success to sailors, to sailors' wives and greasy luck to whalers in turn both highlight the importance of wealth, wealth production in this industry and um, rendering this plentiful oil, this greasy stuff, um, the resulting profits are obviously central here. So it produces, an object like this produces a, a constructed particular kind of masculinity. And a Susan's tooth like this one was one of the first objects accessioned into a museum collection when it was gifted almost 200 years ago to the East India Marine Society, a space that some of you know very well as the Peabody Essex Museum in Salem. At the time, that space, they collected all kinds of curiosities, right, from around the world for what I think was a primarily white audience in a maritime context, being a society founded by captains. So from the very beginning of Scrimshaw's history and collecting, there might have been this interest in reifying whale teeth um, as sort of bolstering ship owners' commercial interests that artists slash laborers like Myrick perpetuated by decorating whale teeth with these ship portraits and verses wishing for their success. So Myrick's work imparts a deep interest in things like ship architecture, American nationalism, whaling's grit. And these pieces built on a long history that I do not have time for of ship portraiture and um, that had its own roots in related naval interests and commercial interests. So artists endorse those ideas when they copy them repeatedly. There is this strong connection between the Navy and whaling, um, including in its imagery, as you can see, in one whaleman's rendering of naval battle and its glorification of explosive violence. In terms of commercial portraits too, I like to look at the example of Cornelius B. Holsart's, um, who's a whaleman, his shoal of sperm whale off the coast of Hawaii, which is a print that serves as a portrait of the ship, William Roach, the eponymous whaling monopolist. And it also depicts several other ships that he owned. The print glorifies then one man's economic violence or dominance rather uh, in these waters thousands of miles from their home port paired with a scene where whales appear in abund abundance. So ultimately the whales are abundant but they are overmanned by their hunters who are posed harpoons in hand for success over them. Yet we know for so many reasons that the same industry um, placed its participants in precarious, if not life-threatening pos positions. So for example, Hulsart, the same artist of that previous scene, created both of these prints because he had actually lost an arm in the industry um, in a whaling accident and sold those pieces out of a New York mariner's home in order to make a living that he no longer could as a whaleman given his disability. And he incurred that injury in the very industry that he's sort of celebrating here in a strange way. So therefore the masculine maritime world that Holsart depicted in these prints was the same one that really brought him great harm. We can see this similar kind of paradox in a whalebone corset busk. Um, let's see if this will work for us here. 
an object intended to be placed in the center part of a corset. So if you're not familiar with these, with these it's um, to sort of offer structure. Um, and this one was made for Elmira Almy in the 1840s. And some years later, she would accompany her husband and teenage son on the Bark Roscoe, where she watched from the deck as both of them were killed in a whaling accident. So Almy's busk and Hulsart's print, objects like this really offer us examples of how artwork can ironically praise whaling's conquest just as it serves as evidence of the trauma, the death, the destruction, and the exploitation of both whales and men that the industry carried out. So if we can understand these bones and teeth as objects that reflect literal loss of life and limb, then I want to name the internal dance that we might experience as onlookers to these objects, because bones can be representative of death and exploitation here of men, but also representative of the death and exploitation of whales. Even if we weren't to consider those stories and simply take the material at face value, I don't think it's too much to ask to imagine that these are bones that still are kind of alive in a way, or teeth in this case. Hand bone, the straight bone cut into pieces from a whale's jaw, it often shape shifts. And you don't have to look that hard to find bones used for scrimshaw that often exhibit their own signs of life after death. Bones tend to curve and warp, especially since whale skeletal bone is pretty permeable. It's full of these tiny canals where blood vessels once ran and therefore in the process of dying, drying, and aging, the whale's bodily agency returns. And I like to take canes as an example. Of course, walking sticks become a fashion connoting literally upstanding masculinity in the 19th century. And this is just a moment here uh, for me to be proud of some of the photography research I've done where I've uncovered more than one illustration of this, these white canes in the hands of whaling captains likely made of whale ivory or bone. But it's this kind of straight man-made object that is especially prone to warping, to bending, to resisting, almost as if it could not sustain the weight of a man's hand. And you can see in this one above, uh, there are some spaces where abalone shell or baleen or, or wood might have been put in there, but they've actually popped out. So there's a moment of sort of literal rejection there. So thin pieces of whalebone are uniquely unpredictable, ones that are manipulated into straight planes. You can see on the slabs of pan bone that make up this lantern, they've sort of warped threatening the structure of this object made for man's use. Bone cannot be confined to straightness. It's as if the whales are kind of bucking or resisting, even in their reduced parts. This one is particularly striking because it was meant to house, perhaps, a spermaceti candle made from the, the same animal that the bone was from. So if we continue to listen to these bones long after the life has seemingly left them, we might reconsider the material and cultural constructs that we map onto them. We can learn a different kind of material lesson from teeth. This one is particularly interesting to me, uh, this one from a whale's living body. This pie crimper implement is one example of sperm whale ivory that exhibits signs of healing itself. These spots are interestingly exposed in this kind of self-referential design here. Um, but in life, the tooth that this was carved from actually created these reparative growths you see on the tip when it was likely reacting to some kind of irritant or other harm and created this growth. It's kind of like a burl forming in a tree. That sort of purling is a reminder of a bodily level of resilience, of repair, a response to changing circumstances during the whale's life. And we might think of these kinds of objects as not altogether unrelated to Maggie Chow's idea of the speaking tooth, speaking teeth, that is ivory that's carved with words that actually give them a voice or other pieces that announce themselves as being part of the whale body. So for example, 
if we can move on here. <laughs> There's a, another pan bone course at Busk here that says, many a ship has chased the whale in which this bone did rest, but now tis made into a busk to support a female's breast. And so this actually is a not uncommon inscription on uh, pan bone corset busks, but they announce themselves as being part of a living whale. And there's a small narrative encapsulated there, right? That acknowledges the material origins. Of course, if it wasn't apparent enough from the actual bone that it's on, right? There are also individual pieces of scrimshaw from known whales or that have particular stories attributed to them like that of the Anne Alexander. And these examples add to our understanding that even long after death, whalemen themselves also extended an understanding of these disarticulated skeletons as having literal afterlives. And for us in museums, Scrimshaw is also really unwieldy in issues of display. If you've ever tried to look at a piece of scrimshaw, it requires full circle. It benefits from physically turning it over in your hands. It's impossible to display, impossible to photograph. Sometimes for rounded pieces like this, it even you can set it on a table and it wobbles. You don't want it to run away. You know, it has movement to it. So whatever perspective you take when you're turning it around in your hands, there are always others that remain obscured. It's in this way too, the body of the whale actually rejects ever being fully seen. So if we're interested in deconstructing how our sense of maritime identity developed, especially for white Americans in the 19th century, and how it continues to impact our literal framings today surrounding the complex lives of these materials, I find it easiest admittedly to turn to contemporary art. Um, so it's very fitting that uh, Courtney Leonard was right before me, really appreciated that. So for one example, we have um, an, upcoming exhibition actually here at the Whaling Museum this spring of Dan Rinaldi's work, Strandings. And his work reflects with bones and whale stamps and um, other objects, these straightforward symbols of whale commodification, the, the whale stamp, to reflect on stranding events and the ongoing mass death of whales. Just to fly through these examples here, there's also, um, we might think of Duke Riley's work, who's another artist who reflects on material abundance and destruction of the world's oceans with works like Sailor's Valentine's and Scrimshaw actually made of beach trash. And then of course, you might be familiar with Courtney Leonard's work, um, who I'm really excited to be on this panel with today, who also expresses ideas about consumption and abundance and absence extraction mass was a word she used earlier and I think all three of these artists exemplify how constructions of maritime identity can shift while we come to understand the destruction wrought by them um, and these offer museum goers spaces of reflection of mourning Oops, guys will go through and then I think in Duke Riley's work, we often think about humor in the tight ironies between our needs, wants, and destructive habits as humans, and also the acknowledgement of resilience, of hope, of um, moving forward, and the possibilities. This will work. <laughs> there we go. Um, so the surface quality of these, I actually like to bring attention to because they're almost iridescent um, and they remind me, these ceramic teeth remind me of that purling, the, the idea of purling that I mentioned earlier and repair the possibility of um, Phoenix rising from the ashes even. So how might we acknowledge the unwieldy nature of these histories of these bodies and beings is it possible to reimagine spaces like museums less as sites of celebration and more of reflection of even grief? I think I am asking questions that are pretty similar to those asked by Alexis Pauline Gum. So I'll just conclude here with a quote from her text entitled Undrowned. What do we need to remember that will push back against the forgetting encouraged by things like consumer culture and linear time? 
What can we remember that will surround us in oceans of history and potential? And the critical question, how? Thank you. Hello, everyone. Let's see if I can get this to do what I want. Yes. So um, I'm also very happy to be here today um, to look more closely at Scrimshaw and other types of artifacts and take part in a dialogue and the beginning of dialogue um, about new ways of looking at things and other ways of looking at things we may not have considered. So I'm Michael Harrison. I am the chief curator of the Nantucket Historical Association. Uh, we run the Nantucket Whaling Museum. Uh, but we are also a historical society for the entire island of Nantucket, and we take quite a broad view of the history of the island and the people of the island. Um, and so although I'm confining myself largely to whaling examples today, I do want to sort of throw into context that we do try and look very broadly at the island and its place in the world, and we really try and tell stories about real people, and I think you'll see that our interest in that comes through um, as I talk here. So. We have a, well, I, I should, I, I'm back up. Um, in the materials that were sent out when I was invited to speak, there we go, two things stood out to me, and these have been repeated a few times today by various speakers. When looking at collections dealing with the Pacific Rim and peoples of the South Pacific and elsewhere um, on the other side of the world from where we are, the term undercatalogued often comes up, and I can certainly Say that that resonates with me. The other thing that resonated is this idea of scrimshaw collections is either being or being presented as rarefied. And I want to talk a just briefly about both of those things. Uh, here is a typical South Pacific object from the Nantucket collection and the way it is cataloged. And it's a little small there, but says this object uh, was once part of the Museum of the Nantucket Athenaeum, which was a 19th century cabinet of curiosities, where it was described as a Polynesian dagger. Its specific island of origin has not been determined. And we have a lot of objects that are like this. And we want to use these objects more fully. We want to take them out of just being souvenirs from whalers and other mariners. We'd like to talk about them um, more fully in exactly the kind of ways um, that this whole day is about. But we are just at the beginning of trying to understand what we already have. Um, and so I don't have very many examples like this to really talk about in a meaningful way today, and so I'm going to confine myself largely to traditional scrimshaw, but I wanted to acknowledge that we are certainly seeking to incorporate these more fully into our discussions and into the context of Nantucket and Nantucket's encounters with the world, and um, we're just going to need some help in identifying and saying something more meaningful about these other than just, well, somebody in the 19th century thought it was a Polynesian dagger. So rarefied scrimshaw. I'm here to tell you scrimshaw is not rare. There is a lot of it and people made a lot of it and it's us who've chosen to make it rare. Um, the market drives it as being rare uh, and it's beneficial for the marketplace to think of it um, as being rare. Contemporary scrimshanders who make commercially driven pieces um, are working with materials that are increasingly rare and so that colors our perspective on it. And then our galleries present it as if it is art, which it is, and that is a completely valid perspective on it. Um, this is in Nantucket, um, in the Whaling Museum, uh, one corner of our scrimshaw gallery that presents this quite amazing dressing case by the New Bedford Captain Archer um, that he made for his wife, caught very few whales in that voyage, and perhaps this is why. But our other galleries, and I'm sorry, these pictures are not terribly great from my cell phone, but they really do present um, and take a sort of a jewel box approach to, uh, to this material, um, very much taxonomic, like with like. Um, there's little intervention by the museum. Um, we have very few labels in this gallery, um, very little bits of explanation. It's sort of presented as if it's all self-explanatory um, and self-evidently beautiful and interesting. Um, and one thing, uh, the, the intro panel, um, that's actually the longest set of words in the entire gallery um, on, on, when you come in the door, and it is by Melville. Um, we rely on Melville way off more often than we should to um, protect ourselves from saying things about whaling and about the 19th century uh, and about scrimshaw. Um, and I just don't quite understand why we couldn't find 
um, a Nantucket voice to say something about Scrimshaw, um, or perhaps maybe even the curator's voice to, to put there, or maybe even the public's voice to put there. Um, and so I think, you know, the jewel box approach that we all, that we all take, um, you know, has some advantages. Um, it's beautiful, it's simple, um, but it also has big disadvantages. And I, I think some of these are, 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 are instructive for the project that, that New Bedford and maybe lots of our sister museums are all trying to do, is that the jewel box approach and the art approach does not suggest the motivations behind this scrimshaw. And we've already seen today from other speakers um, quite a number of, of ways that there are motivations behind, um, behind these works. Uh, it doesn't really acknowledge emotion other than just a communion with, with art and beauty that's sort of unacknowledged. Um, it really doesn't get it change over time and Scrimshaw does develop um, as practitioners change and, and their encounters change over time. Uh, and it also omits the voices of the makers. Um, their voices are very hard to hear in the kind of traditional gallery that Nantucket has, has taken as its approach. Um, and I think that maybe we could change that. So I wanted to ask a little bit of a question, what is Scrimshaw about? And I'm gonna suggest a couple of ways of looking at Scrimshaw. These are by no means exhaustive and we've already heard from a number of um, people this morning who have suggested ways of thinking about this in terms of cultural connections, in terms of um, different community perspectives, uh, in terms of subsistence, um, in terms of just the whale's body itself and the, the sort of in, um, interior um, conflict of, of working with um, materials from from whales from from creatures that you've hunted. So I'm I'm there are many more than than I'm going to get into, but I just wanted to suggest a number of ways of thinking about what Scrimshaw is about. I think it is about lived experiences. Um, these are men and sometimes women, but mostly men, um, going out across the world recording the things that they see. Um, you know, we look at this and say, okay, well, this tells us a lot about whaling and whaling practice but these men are doing something that is completely divorced from their at-home experiences, and they are recording it for either their own benefit or the benefit of people they hope to see and encounter again in the future. Um, and a lots of scrimshaw is this. It is a, a record of, of the present. And there should be a next slide, there we go. Um, as I said, it's about the present. It's very, it's very contemporary. Um, you know, here we have, um, you know, the, not only just a whaling scene, but he's also observing the, the American trading vessel on the right that's that's going by. This is off the coast of Australia, Lord Howe Island, um, and Bell's Pyramid, um, Ball's Pyramid rather, off to off to the right. And then, of course, he's recorded the latitude and longitude of this scene, um, very much recording of the present, of the now. Oops, sorry, skipping over here. Um, and very much this is whalers looking at themselves and looking at their circumstances and, the, you know, recording the things they witness, um, looking at the people they meet um, and the situations that they find themselves in. And, and as we know from other parts of the discussion today, there's a great deal that we can look at and tease out about cultural connection and about encounters with, with other and different cultures and how those talk to each other, but on a more basic level. You know they're recording things. So this is the this is a a, a Hilliot tooth. Uh, unfortunately, not in the best condition. But you know these are two sides of the same tooth, where the artist is recording uh, a fairly traditional whaling scene that presumably he has taken part in, and then is recording um, an inhabitant of one of the islands that they visited. Um, and there are many teeth by this artist um, that sort of do this. We have two um, that in fact uh, are easy to confuse with each other in our collection because the whaling scenes are almost identical. And then the people on the other side um, are also sort of fairly similar, a uh, man and a woman um, as a pair. Um, but another thing that Scrimshaw I think is about, and I think that we may want to acknowledge um, more about, is it is about community and is about belonging. And there are a couple of different kinds of communities that it addresses. Um, you know, there are certainly a lot of teeth that engage in this, um, you know, free trade and sailors' rights. Uh, the one over here with the whale um, on it, I, I, I've then outlined, um, you know, liberty and unity being there, you know, staking out that you as a sailor belong to a sailor community um, that you wish to be more part of and you wish to, to express that you belong to, um, and then carrying that identity back to land with you or, or, or creating things that, that um, 
present your your acknowledgement of that identity to to the others around you. So I think um, communities at sea and belonging to them is definitely a, a big part of Scrimshaw. There's also then belonging to communities on land and remembering and acknowledging that you belong to these other communities while you're engaged in activities at sea. So this is a tooth um, from the 1830s uh, covered in Masonic iconography. Um, so we have a Masonic temple with the sun and moon stones on the facade. We have the pillars and the archway entering into the lodge room and then many of the accoutrement and symbols of the lodge room, including the altar and its candle, the keys, the, the more traditional uh, and familiar um, compass and square. And then even the, um, the tessellated floor along, along the bottom is a Masonic symbol, um, all of which, you know, is a, if we imagine this piece being made at sea, is a whaler thinking about the community he belongs to back at home and making a piece that really is only readable by the members of that particular part of his land-based community. And none of this would be evident. This tooth um, displayed on Nantucket would be in a case, humble jumble, with a lot of other teeth, um, all of which, as, as Marina just said, um, difficult to read if you cannot turn them over and turn them all around. Um, but yet, you know, there's so much complexity and interest here um, tying this person, presumably in the Pacific, back to a community um, either in the United States or in the United Kingdom. So other ways to look at, um, at this, you know, what is Scrimshaw about? A lot of Scrimshaw is about friendship. Here's a piece. This is actually the back of the Burdette tooth that I showed earlier, um, where this was given as a gift from a Nantucket businessman, former whaler, um, to a business associate in the United Kingdom. Uh, and he had a local engraver put this on the back. Um, and I think friendship and those kind of connections are not necessarily things we get into as much when we just look at Scrimshaw as being art. Uh, love, I think, is a more obvious one. Um, lots and lots of Scrimshaw connects, you know, and seems to be about um, men making gifts for their female uh, love interests or partners or family members. Uh, these are just two of the most obvious examples that I could pick quite quickly of, you know, one uh, sailor's return scenes, um, you know, both from the 1840s, judging by their, their modes of dress. Um, but I think talking about love and connection um, at sea is something we also don't necessarily do explicitly enough in our museums, and we might benefit from doing that. Um, longing and nostalgia, um, I think, are also uh, things that come up in Scrimshaw time and time and time again um, that we could do um, more work to acknowledge. And then just to tie all those sort of human connection issues together, I wanted to, you know, these are just a number of, of very strong pieces uh, that, that sort of get beyond just mere teeth. Um, the, the candlesticks, I think, are um, extremely thought-provoking once you start to really think about them. Um, again, a uh, previous speaker made a reference to this. You know, here we have candlesticks made of whale bone and whale ivory used presumably to burn high-end spermaceti candles. Um, sort of whole package of the dead whale going to human use. Um, but I think even beyond that, these as a representation of a land-based community where you might use these and sit at the table or sit at, you know, and, and engage with other people through illumination. Um, I think these are extremely powerful objects about that, um, in addition to being powerful objects about their own aesthetics. Uh, the busk and the busk also, this is, you know, a, a, a carefully, um, carved and cut busk rather than being one with text or with other images. Uh, the food chopper, this was actually made for the wife of a whaler. Um, she did not accompany her husband on the young hero in 1850, I'm gonna forget the exact date, um, but their newly born child died just after he had left and she corresponded with him while he was already en route. And they decided that she and their surviving child should sail out from Boston to Valparaiso and meet up with him and accompany him on the rest of his voyage. And he and his crew made a cabin ready for her. They made toys for her, for the, for the child who came. They made this um, highly domestic um, and possibly not quite welcoming food chopper object for her. Um, but we have all of those objects in our collection and I think could do more with them. Uh, and then the rolling pin also representing this sort of, you know, thinking of people at home. There we go. So one of my colleagues asked me the other day, how much scrimshaw do you think is on the bottom of the ocean from having been tossed aside, not being very good, not being very interesting, 
what are they doing? They are filling their time. You know, whalers have a little bit of extra time. They're not the merchant sailors, you know, taking their clipper ship as fast as humanly possible across the ocean. They're waiting for whales. And they have these byproducts and they have time on their hands and creative interest and talent in some instances and lots of no talent in other instances. And I think we don't engage in this. We don't engage in these sort of very human emotions that are behind these things. This is a set of napkin rings. Um, these are just six. Um, we have 12, they're from a set that we know comprised 24 originally, each one absolutely different, um, totally amazing. Um, we have this tentative attribution to Erasmus Mathewson, uh, thanks to Stuart Frank's work. Um, but, you know, really incredible. What, 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 you know, is it just art? No, I think there's more to it than that. So that suggests, you know, maybe some other ways that we could display scrimshaw. And I want to completely acknowledge that, you know, bringing in other kinds of carving traditions to, uh, to scrimshaw is, I think, something we absolutely need to be doing. And I'm so glad that this day is here for us to talk about those things. I don't have a good examples of that yet from Nantucket that we've been able to do, um, but I want to acknowledge that we are hoping to head there. Um, but I do want to suggest, you know, perhaps a few other ways other than art that we can talk about Scrimshaw. One is the stuff I was just talking about, we should absolutely be talking about friendship and love and community and boredom. Like, why not? You know, if you went out on a whaling voyage and made things and came back and gave them to people, you probably wouldn't hand the tooth to your niece and then not say anything. You'd probably say something about why you made it. No, I was thinking of you. And oh, this is what this means on the back. And you've never seen a whale hunt, but I've seen a whale hunt. And, you know, I lost my arm in a whale hunt. Like, I think we need to talk about some of those things. And obviously I'm being a little imaginative and there is scholarship and there is, you know, being honest about what we do and do not know about these individual pieces. But in some instances, we know quite a bit that I don't think we're actually getting to. Come on. There we go. Uh, so here is um, a tooth that I'm gonna use for a couple of examples here. Um, one, I think we need to be talking about real people as much as possible. And it is not always possible. There's a lot of inference we have to do. There's a lot of um, an anonymity to a lot of these pieces. Um, and, but there are, there's also a lot of non-anonymity. Um, just in the Nantucket collection alone, there, we have 83 identified artists that we can say biographical things about. 47 of those are people specifically born on Nantucket. Um, many more than just those 47 are people associated with Nantucket and with Nantucket voyages or Nantucket economy. Um, this tooth is an example of that. Well, we know exactly who Edward Starbuck was. We know what voyage he was on in 1835. He was aboard the ship Mariner um, of Nantucket. He was on his way home when he carved this in, or engraved this rather, in March of 1835. Uh, the one side is a whaling scene and says liberty and unity, which I showed earlier. Uh, this side is a port scene with a, with a seaman's Bethel um, and a couple of trading ships. And then there are three separate poems um, put onto this tooth that get us back to emotions and humanity. And I think we could do more with these objects, um, not just Scrimshaw, but all kinds of objects, but Scrimshaw is my example, to you know, engage emotions and get at empathy. And so this, this is one stanza of one of the three poems that's on this tooth, um, which you can all see there, but I'll read it aloud. While on the sea, my days are spent in anxious care, off discontent, no circles, no social circles here are found, few friends to virtue here abound. I think of home, sweet home denied with her I love by my side. Nobody in my gallery can read this. That all of this text is either upside down or on the bottom of the tooth. You cannot read this. In fact, this was not in our catalog record until three days ago. Um, you know, but what could be like, it's, I mean, Yes, there's all kinds of things to say here about the tooth and the hunting and, you know, and these actual words, but like if you actually engage with these words, I think there's a lot here that brings us closer to this person and his experience um, going on in this poem. We also get to some of his motivations maybe for making Scrimshaw, maybe possibly his motivations for going whaling. Um, when will kind fortune set me free that I can quit the boisterous sea? I love my friends, I love the shore. Mm -hmm. I love to leave the ocean's roar. Then home, sweet home, 
shall be my pride with her I love near by my side. Uh, the two other poems on this, one is a, a fairly standard um, hymn tune or, or hymn text uh, that's all about sort of preserving sailors in danger. Uh, and then there's a single stanza bit of doggerel that he seems to have written um, as well that's basically saying, um, there are a lot of temptations at all these islands I'm going to, and I have to remember my loved one back at home and stay on the straight and narrow. Um, so like, there's all kinds of, of sort of human interest, real people, we know who this man was, there's just a lot here, and we aren't doing anything with it yet. Um, never mind setting this against other objects from other cultures, from other traditions, and, and seeing what they say to each other. Oops, all right. Um, so then, so I wanna make sure I didn't skip a slide here. No, I did. All right. All right, well, that didn't work. Ah, you're gonna get the punchline before I get there. All right, um, so, to, to, to summarize, um, you know, sort of where, where, where does this all go and where does this all take us and where are we hoping to be on Nantucket? Um, I think uh, aside from looking at these pieces and actually talking about them a little more fully and taking them out of their sort of rarefied context, um, I really think that making connections is not only a theme for today, but uh, something we should, you know, have graven on ivory and put in our pockets. Um, you know, that we 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 need to sort of get out of our habit of treating scrimshaw just as like its own thing off in a room by itself and mix it in with other um, other types of objects, mix it with itself, mix it with, with ways of looking. Um, and so here I've just done, you know, this is just an extremely simple juxtaposition. Um, but, you know, again, we have a fashionable scene copied from a fashion plate in a, in a popular magazine, completely contemporary of its day. Um, circulated in the Pacific, um, you know, widely read by these whalers, the contemporary press, um, you know, and why are we not actually displaying this against some of the tools used to end up with this as a byproduct of whale hunting? Um, I could have thrown in here a picture of the, of one of the jawbones of the whale or of the entire whale or of the whale boat or any of a number of other ways that we could look at this other than just having identified that Harper's Weekly in whatever month of 1856 had a fashionable scene. Um, so I would encourage us as museum practitioners to you know, mix the scrimshaw types together, mix the scrimshaw with the non-scrimshaw, again, a big theme of the day, um, and for goodness sakes, desegregate the scrimshaw. Why is the scrimshaw all in its own gallery by itself, you know, self-evidently proclaiming to the public that it's great, maybe we need to be a little more active and take it out of that space and put it with some of these other stories and these other objects. Um, and with that in mind, just gonna get to my final thought here. Oh, there we are, I just said that. Just a little bit of um, suggestion from, from my museum experience, and that is juxtaposition. And juxtaposition was in uh, the call for today. Um, and I, we've seen quite a few really good ones in the previous uh, discussions today, and I'm hoping we'll see more this afternoon, but I really do think that in museum practice, you will never write a label that will be as powerful as the objects that you put next to each other. And so if all you do is put the scrimshot together in a case by itself, you will have less impact, I think, on your visitors than if you take it out and put it against other ideas and other stories. Um, people come to museums to commune with real things, and I think we need to show them the real things and really think about how we put things together. And with that, I'll conclude. <laughs>